and welcome to the Blue Line, your home for Penn State hockey here on WHBO. We're back for week two. Mike Tressa joined alongside Andrew Callista, and Thanksgiving weekend was a busy one for Penn State. No rest for the Lions as another top 20 team was visiting Pagula the second time this month. Yeah, the 15th ranked Union Dutchmen were coming to town. Frozen 14 two years ago, another quality opponent coming into Pagula. Hopefully those games against UMass Lowell provided the Lions with some experience for them to be able to get out of this series with at least one W. And they got some good news starting the weekend off as Union's leading scorer Daniel Carr did not make the trip from Schenectady. He stayed there with an upper body injury. Penn State opened things up on Saturday night just after the football team beat Wisconsin. More on that later. Lions looking for their own upset and it's Matt Scoff doing it early. Not one, but two breakaway chances stopped by the Dutchman. Union, though, would finally beat Scoff in the first quick pass from Matt Wilkins and Kevin Sullivan gets the goal. 1-0 after 1-2-0 in the second. Shane Gossesbeer with a ridiculous full ice find to Daniel Champagne. Look at that. Behind the legs through the defenders. 3-0. Not looking good, but on the Lions' own power play, Eric Scheid taking himself all the way up, making moves and beating Colin Stevens for the goal. Big weekend for number 19. Into the third, though, all PSU. Shad finds Patrick Cowdice at the top, and the defenseman buries his first goal of the season. Lines down one. Three minutes later, it'd be Kenny Brooks getting involved. Watch 13 across the middle, gets the pass from Taylor Holstrom and finishes. Tie game, set the place rocking even without the student section. Tommy Olchik had a good chance for the lead a minute later, but comes up short, and it would be the Dutchman. A falling Champini hitting Max Novak for the game winner. Lions chances for the upset over with that goal. Union wins 4-3, Penn State rallied, but unable to overcome a slow start. And I think you have to learn how to win games like that. I think we're, it's a good start that we can get there, but it's a, it's a fine line in, in those types of games, having success and closing it out, it's a fine line. I mean, you come in and teams kind of gain momentum at the start, kind of deflates our tires a little bit. And you can't expect to win when you can't win, you know, come out. Ready to go. Like you said, once we were down a few, we, uh, we came back. We just got to play a full 60, and, and uh, you know, tomorrow we'll, that's what we're planning on doing and go from there. You heard it, Coach Kodowski and the guys looking to play a full 60 minutes, and that's exactly what they would try to do in game two. And let me tell you, they did get off to the fast start. Let's go to the video. Coach O'Brien, Fitzy, and Butler in the house, fresh off the win against Whiskey. No Vandy and Coach Fisher, wonder why. Early power play, Luke Yuha shot from the point. Zach saw right place, right time, in front, puts it home. one nothing. Lions four minutes in. Lions on the power play again. Goodwin down to Shide, great look to Yuha, beats him six side. Lions roar out to the 2-0 lead early on. Freshman Eamon McAdam looking for his first win. Nine saves in the first to shut out Union. In the second, 2-1 after the Dutchman goal. Eric Scheid with the wrister from the point there. You saw it, the deflection. Best five points this weekend and his sixth goal. All things going right for the Lions. David Glenn, look at that, look at that goal. Flicks it off, off the goalie, Colin Stevens. Stevens would be pulled. The Dutchman would be sparked. The fans are fired up for this one. What would spark the Dutchman? Well, penalties for the Lions. One minute later, nice puck movement. Shane got a spear from the slot, makes it 4-2. to two. He would tack on another to make it 4-3, heading into the third. Seven minutes into the third, Dutchman 2-1-1. On Matt Hatch deflected off a U-Haw pass. McAdam, three-goal lead gone for the Lions. And there you go, Daniel Campini crushing the Lions with three seconds left in the game as he gets around David Thompson, slides a pass. Lions fall on this one, 5-4 to four after leading 4-1. to one. It's not one play at the end by one individual that cost us the game by any means. No way. This was, uh, we got tight. We stopped doing the things that, uh, that got us to the point where we were at, and, um, and that's what happened. I don't think we've yet to play a full 60-minute game, and uh, to beat teams like Wisconsin and Michigan and and uh, Minnesota, we're going to have to really put in full effort and have everybody uh, pull in the same way to win. Penn State just unable to get that 60-minute effort. Here are the stats for the series. Penn State falls to 3-7-1. and one. Penalties the problem, 12 taken in the two games. Both teams well over their average on the power play, but the Lions giving up too many shots. The Dutchman offense out shooting the Lions by 21, and Coach Kodowski gave his final thoughts on the series in this week's Sounding Off, brought to you by Ace Hardware State College. From the start of the season up to this point, you you try to gain experience and you try to learn lessons, and, and we've had that opportunity. But um, we sort of thought that we were taking a step, and and obviously in the in the third period we let it get away. And so I'm pleased with the progress, but we definitely took a step back tonight, or not tonight. I, I take that back in the third period. 
One positive for the Lions this weekend was our player of the week, and it's not much of a question for us. Eric Scheid, the redshirt sophomore with five points, scored in each of the game, picked up three assists. We saw that great assist that he had to Luke Yuha with the pass through the slot. His power play goal really gave the Lions a spark they needed in game one. Scheid is showing the offensive spark the Lions need to get more scoring chances going forward. All right, and let's continue right there with the good and take a breakdown of the things the Lions did well from this weekend. Mike, one thing I really liked that the Lions did this weekend was the intensity they brought. They brought it all 60 minutes in game one, and they really started out in game two with it. Union and Penn State from the start of game one played an extremely physical and chippy game, and the Lions didn't back down one bit. Even when down three, the Lions were still hitting and being aggressive to bring the game back to a tie at three all. And when things were falling apart in game two, the Lions were a little bit tighter. You could sense it on the ice, but were right there they're fighting and close to a win, if not for the deflection off of Yuha and that last second great goal by David Campini. And the Lions' power play was phenomenal for the weekend, converting on three of their six chances, especially two in the first period of game two. That's exactly what a team like Penn State, in need of scoring, averaging just two and a half goals a game, has to convert on to compete in the conference. Now, the next thing to do is get more than six power play chances in a weekend and stop allowing so many for the opponents. Like it's funny you say that, allowing so many power play opportunities for the opponents. That takes us right into my bad for the week. Too many penalties and too many penalties at key times for the Lions. And that really hurt the Lions in game two against Union when they allowed three power play goals and committed five penalties all in the second period. One of those times resulted in a five on three advantage for Union and just as that ended, off face off, got a Spears first of the two goals with that laser of a slap shot. Penn State is averaging seven penalties in a game and while their penalty kill numbers have been good, too many chances, especially against good scoring teams, will start to wear down that unit and lead to goals, especially going forward with big physical teams in the Big Ten. And another thing that will hurt the Lions and lead to goals is turnovers and breakaway chances. Champini had an amazing goal to end the game, but Union had so many other good looks like this shorthanded turnover when it was 2-1 Lions. That could have changed the game earlier or even the two chances early in game one of the series against Scoff. Penn State is living too dangerously with some of these plays and has to be better with the puck. And when we come back on the blue line, your inside look at Penn State hockey continues as we dive in to take a look at Penn State's next opponent, the Wisconsin Badgers. We have a long way to go. Union is an excellent hockey team. I heard Wisconsin is pretty good too. You know what I mean? Um, it's not getting any easier. Is and welcome back to the blue line. It keeps getting tougher for Penn State as Big Ten Conference play starts this weekend. Penn State hits the road. They travel to Wisconsin. Yeah, the Badgers are going to come into this one ranked 17th after they fell five spots because they lost two this week to number one Minnesota. That's two losses on the road to a number one ranked Minnesota team. Very tough place to play, very tough place to win. So we'll see how that fuels the Badgers moving forward against Penn State and what they can do against Penn State. Lions have now lost four in a row. Let's take a look at the J-Magai Mitsubishi matchup board to see how the teams stack up. Well, Mike, right from the start, you see both teams enter the series under 500 and look pretty even with goals scored and goals allowed. After a good weekend, though, Penn State converting better on the power play where they went three for six this past weekend. Wisconsin great on the penalty kill, tops in the Big Ten, and they don't give up many chances like the Lions on the penalty. But check out the schedule the Badgers have played. This is what makes that record. Wisconsin has lost twice to the number one team. They've lost to the number nine team, split on the road with number 12, Miami, Ohio, and came away with a win in a tie to 14th ranked Lake Superior State. Talk about a rough early season schedule. Coach Godowski knows the challenge that awaits. From here on out, it's pretty darn tough. And uh, you're gonna have to, we're gonna have to commit to those objectives 100% for us to have for us to have the best chance at success for sure. It's certainly, I think everybody understands, it's not a matter of just going out there and throwing our skill against their skill and see what happens. We're, that's not, I think we all understand that's not going to happen. Penn State goes into this Wisconsin series needing a much needed win. And right now we're going to take a look at some things that they need to work on so Coach Godowski and his guys could get some momentum going forward in the Big Ten. And the first things first, it's been said by the coach, it's been said by the players, it's been said by pretty much everyone that's following this team. What they really need to work on is putting together a 60-minute game. That's been the major problem. If only they could have put their second and third periods from Saturday together with Sunday's first period. Penn State made a late rush Saturday after falling behind 3-0. They were unable to come back and then unable to hold on to a lead after a 4-1. That's a 4-1 lead in the second Sunday. 
Coach Gadowski said his team needs to improve its maturity in order to know what they need to do, especially once Big Ten play begins. Yeah, and Coach Gadowski said he specified that they need to grow up in terms of experience, saying that it's a young team, they need to play together and at a higher level heading into Big Ten play. And another thing we touched on earlier is the penalty problem that plagues Penn State. Penn State is averaging seven penalties per game. That's worst in the conference. Yeah, that's way too many. And even though they are ranked 18th in the country on the penalty kill, when you're spending that much time on the ice, it's just not good. That burned them as you just saw Union getting too many chances, especially during the five on three. That's evident as well with the shot differential. Union outshot Penn State 77 to 56. Much of that with the extra power play chances late in the game. Penn State, especially against a Wisconsin team that doesn't allow penalties, cannot lose the penalty margin as much as they have been the last two series. And usually now the focus would be on a key player for the opponent, but this week we're doing something a little bit differently and putting the focus on the Kohl Center. Wisconsin is 3-0-1 this season at home. The arena is the second biggest in the country, and they have led the league in attendance 14 out of the last 15 years. But get this, last team to win there, February of last year, it was the Lions in OT, a huge win for Penn State's program and a big blow to Wisconsin. You could bet that's fresh in the minds of the Badgers, and Gadowski knows it. I'm sure they weren't happy about it, and I'm sure they don't want that to happen again. I, I, I doubt that they, you know, I'm sure they've been looking forward to this game, and that's fine by us. I mean, we're Penn State, and uh, they're not the only team that's going to be itching to beat us. Defense will be key for the Lions this week in Madison, and two of those guys are Patrick Cowdice and David Thompson. Our own Elise Murkowski caught up this week with Cowdice in this week's Player Profile. I'm here with redshirt junior defenseman Patrick Cowdice. And Patrick, you had your first goal against Union of the season. Can you kind of tell us about what, these, what your success was this weekend and what allowed you to get your goal? Uh, yeah, it started with Friedman down low. He was working, uh, battling down low, passed to Scheid. Scheid made a nice pass, and they both went to net. Just, I kind of put on net. They had a good screen and um, kind of worked out. And you and Thompson had a lot of success on the penalty kill. What, um, what allows you guys to mesh and really be able to have that success? Yeah, do you know what? He's a great player, and um, I like playing with him. Uh, we're just, you know, trying to get in shot lanes, um, good stick, and try to block some shots, and it's been working out. So in 2011, you were picked up in the fifth round by the Washington Capitals. Can you uh, tell people about that experience? Uh, yeah, it was a great experience. Um, you know, they're a great organization. I was fortunate enough, like you said, back in 2011 to uh, be picked up. Um, been at camp with them for the past three years, and they're an unbelievable organization, and, you know, I'm happy to be a part of that. Just, you know, we're here now and uh, trying to play some good hockey at Penn State and then see how it works out. Thanks very much, Pat. Thank you. Back to you guys. Thanks, Elise. And when we come back, we'll take a look at the season through the eyes of Penn State historian Lou Prado and what he sees hockey becoming at Penn State. The Blue Line we will be right back. We're a very, very young program uh, with very young experiences. So that often comes. It's not like you can just bring guys together and they, they're, you're done. It, 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 you, you get maturity by playing in wars. Welcome back to the Blue Line, your inside look at Penn State hockey. Joining me, a good friend of mine, author of We Are Penn State, the story of the 2012 Penn State football team. But we're not talking football today. Mr. Lou Prado. Lou, thanks for being here. Andrew, thanks for having me. So a lot of people know you of your uh, historical perspective with Penn State athletics, but specifically football, not a lot of people know, including me, just recently found out that you started as a hockey reporter out in well, Pittsburgh. Well, I didn't actually start. I, you know, I, I was an old news, news guy, well, a young news guy like you. And in 1966, I went to work for the uh, TV station in Pittsburgh, Channel 11. It's still there, the NBC affiliate. Uh, prior to that, you know, I, I, I knew a little bit about hockey because the Pittsburgh Hornets, Hornets were the American Hockey League team. When they uh, had the original draft in Montreal, uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins organization just just been formed. They decided to fly the media uh, up on a charter plane to Montreal to cover the draft. And right after that, the Hockey News called me up. And I I was aware of the Hockey News, but you know the Bible of professional hockey. And they asked me to be the sport correspondent for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And so I did that for two years before I moved to Detroit. So that's how you got your start. What were you thinking when Penn State started their hockey program, especially with the Penguins so involved, and, and what are your expectations for the program? Well, I didn't, I didn't really follow the Icers. I mean, I followed them. I never went to the games. I mean, I, it, 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 I know he's going into detail on it, but I like Joe Batista, but I just w didn't have the big interest. But once they talked about uh, big-time uh, collegiate hockey, 
I got really interested in, of course, the Pagola Arena, and I really love it now. I mean, I can't believe it. It's as great as it is. I mean, I mean, the fights are missing. You know, watch a little TV of the of the of the pros this time. They're still doing the fighting, which is good. They don't have the fights, but there's a that's a very good style, a class of hockey that uh, that the Penn State uh, team plays now. You mentioned you know big time hockey and things like that. Where is hockey going to fall, in your opinion? in the hierarchy of sports at Penn State, football, wrestling, hockey, or is hockey going to jump up to that number two spot? Well, I'm not sure hockey can ever jump in, the, jump in the number two spot because wrestling is so popular around here. You know, if basketball takes off, watch out because this could be a great basketball area. But I think the hockey fans, and there are a lot of hockey fans, kids are growing up playing hockey nowadays. They're not growing up, uh, you know, boxing like they used to do. So you have kids from Philadelphia, Scranton, Pittsburgh, uh, Erie, wherever, they, they play hockey. So they're interested in it. And then you and, and you have a you have a good solid crowd. Now you may not get the crowd in the middle of the week, but the games aren't played in the middle of the week. You know they're played Friday and Saturday or Friday, Saturday and Sunday night games. And I think they'll they'll, they'll fill that arena, particularly if they become pretty good. I mean they almost beat uh, U Union. Uh, yeah, they've had a couple good I mean, matches. I mean, you know they they got to get you know they got to get the penalties straightened out. I mean they whether the penalties are called correctly or not, they still have to deal with it because you can't you can't let the officials dictate a game. Uh, but I think they're I think fans are going to get in. I think the common, the average fan who doesn't know much about hockey they they'll They'll get pent up on it, and I mean, if, if this team becomes successful, watch out. You just never know. Lou, that's all the time we got for today. Thank you so much for being here. It goes quick when you're having fun, right? It always goes fun being with you, Andrew. Mike, why don't you give us an update on Coach Brandwine's women's team this week? Thanks, guys. It's now time to take a look at the women's hockey team. Had a hard-fought 1-1 tie against Maine this past weekend. The team turning things around after eight losses, having beaten Lindenwood and then the tie. The women traveled to Mercyhurst this Friday and Saturday looking for a College Hockey America Conference win. Shannon Yoxheimer, the new leading scorer after her goal on Saturday. And the other star from Saturday, senior goalie Nicole Paniccia. She had 44 saves helping the Lions preserve that tie. She's the focus of our player profile this week with Elise Murkowski. I'm here with senior goalkeeper Nicole Paniccia. And Nicole, you had a really big game against Maine, 44 saves. Can you kind of assess your play and what led you to that success? Yeah, well, personally, I love getting a lot of shots. And, you know, that was a game where we did get a lot of shots on net. And, um, you know, you don't really have time to just sit there and thank you. You know, you're always getting shots. So it's just you're always in the game. And that's what I loved about the game. So. And you guys had a big win and a tie, kind of breaking this losing streak. What has the morale been as the success has been coming along? Yeah, well, Coach has a saying, uh, something to prove, nothing to lose. So that's definitely something that we've been going off of. I mean, in our preseason polls, we've ranked last. So nobody really expects us to do anything, and that's something that we've been going off of, is that we really have nothing to lose. So that's what we've been going off of. And you transferred from UConn, and you're playing with some of your teammates that you played with at UConn. Yeah. What's that been like for you? Has there been chemistry? How has that led to some yeah. of the recent success? Well, it's been awesome. I mean, when I came here, I've actually been roommates with Jenna Welch for this is my fourth year. So we've, we're really good friends, and me and Taylor have, you know, obviously gone back to UConn. It's just been awesome. Like, we're leaders on the team, and, you know, we're the, really the only ones that have had D1 experience before coming to Penn State. So um, it's great to lead a team with them, and they're great people. So it's awesome to have them here with, with me. Thanks for your time, Nicole. Back to you guys. Thanks, Lise. And when we come back, we'll take a look around Big Ten conference play as that started last weekend. That and more when the Blue Line returns. Division one hockey is you have a lot of very mentally tough individuals and very mentally tough teams. And then, and then you get in the Big Ten and you've got some incredibly mentally tough teams that are incredibly talented too. And we have to grow up because we have to understand that the type of game that we have to play to have success is is not an easy game to play. Welcome back to the Blue Line. You heard Coach Guy Gadowski talking about the toughness of playing in the Big Ten. Penn State will be playing their first conference game of the year this season, their first conference game ever, actually, as the season as the conference just opened up. And that's a good point about the mental toughness really needed to succeed. Yeah, Coach really understands it, and he nails it. I mean, with the Big Ten having two of the top three teams in the country this season, plus, like we said earlier, I mean, they got some really, really tough places to play, like they're going to experience this week in the Kohl Center. A lot of reasons to be positive around Penn State hockey, but let's be honest, it's going to be a challenge this season in the Big Ten. As the Big Ten, as a conference as a whole, the first game took place this weekend, and they were dominated by the two teams that were mentioned at the top of that conference, Minnesota and Michigan. Taking a look at the standings now, number one, Minnesota took care of business at home against Wisconsin to improve to 11-2-1 overall, but third-ranked Michigan right on their tail at 10-2-1 after winning a home and home series with the Buckeyes. That puts Ohio State and Wisconsin at the bottom for now as Penn State and Michigan State have yet to play in conference. 
That changes this week as both teams are in conference battles. Michigan State with a tough opening test, hosting the top-ranked Minnesota Golden Gophers. Michigan State trying to ride the momentum of two wins over Princeton. Penn State, of course, traveling to the Kohl Center to face the Badgers. And rounding out conference play this week, the Wolverines hosting Ferris State in a Wednesday night game. Now time to shift gears back to the Lions and we'll take a look at two of the big moments from the series against the Union and first starting with our Aaron's Amazing Save of the Week. Yeah, this week honors go to Matt Scott. David Thompson's pass is deflected. He blocks Jeff Taylor's shot, but look at the rebound effort as Scott blocks Matt Hatch with the pad save and then the body. We'll slow things down, look at the extension, then falling on the puck. Scott made some great saves in the loss, stopping 30 shots. That's a lot of saves. And now time for the Cove Crunch of the Week. This one going to Zach Saar. Matt Hatch didn't have a chance. Boom! As soon as he gets the puck, boards to the face. Don't mess with the big 6'4 freshman. Take another look as we slow things down. This one, a uh, hit you here. Just, ooh. What a hit. Yeah, and that's good for the Cove Crunch of the Week honors. It's painful just watching it here. Pagula's empty this week in the varsity sports, but the Pagula spotlight continues here on the blue line. And this week, we take a look at one of the areas that's open to the public, all year long. It's not just a hockey facility, it's a multi, you know, figure skating, public session, broom ball. Um, a lot of people we want using this facility in, in a lot of different uh, ways. It is not only the main sheet at Pagula, but the new arena features a community rink the exact same size. The second rink can act as a standalone facility, and while it serves the Penn State hockey teams, it is going to be a busy place for all kinds of community ice time. Um, so this rink was basically for everyday use. 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. every single day. We want to do uh, hockey tournaments. Uh, obviously, we had an ice show in the early part of November, so we want to expand on what we're doing. The rink has a capacity to fit up to 350 people, plus provides unique aerial viewpoints for extra spectators. And right now, Chris Whitmore is working to pack the rink for any community needs. We do have some ice to sell. Uh, we haven't gotten to be fully um, full schedule as of yet, but again, we plan on doing a lot of events here. I was getting ready to go out there and play a little broom ball, skate around, but I didn't want to embarrass myself. Well, you know, I could skate. I'm like Luis Mendoza, though. I just can't stop, so I'd be crashing all over the boards. A little Mighty Ducks reference in there. Some actual notes to get to at the end of this weekend series of the Badgers. Penn State getting some players back. Max Gardner played last game after missing a few. He's back to 100%, and Mike Williamson, the defenseman, the freshman, Coach Kodowski said he'll be back in the rotation after missing the last two games. Keys for me this weekend. Penalties, penalties, penalties. Wisconsin, 20% on the power play, and they also are second in the Big Ten in penalty minutes per game, Mike. So Friday at 8 and Saturday at 9, Coach Gadowski said this week's been business-like for his team, and we'll see the results coming up at Wisconsin. We'll see you guys next week. That does it for the Blue Line this week. From Mike Tressa, Andrew Callista, have a great week.